Look, up in the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane. No, it's today's episode of 40K Today. Hi there, 40K friends, and welcome to 40K Today. This is your daily 15-minute News, views and interviews show that covers the whole of the hobby of Warhammer 40,000. I'm your host, Steve Joel, and today we've got a really special episode for you, covering off as much as we know so far about the new uh, edition of 40K with three guys who know the game really well. All of them make a heap of great content, and all three of them have been covering 40K in a lot of detail over the years and been watching every release over the past few days. So we'll get to that in a second. First, though... Let's have a look at the results of this week's very interesting poll. So for the past week, we've been running a poll on our Facebook and Twitter pages asking which is the most iconic tank in the history of 40K. We've narrowed it down to the Land Raider and the Lehman Russ, and the results are in. Uh, You, the people of the 40K universe, have spoken. I've got to say I love Tom's comment. From a miniature point of view, he says... The original Land Raider kit was super iconic and a building block to the aesthetic of 40K today. The game, not the podcast. Yeah, thanks, Tom. And he's on the winning team as well. 53% of people say the Land Raider, which just quietly means that my friend John Damaris and I win the team bet. Paul Murphy and Tanya Gates were backing the Lehman Rust to win this. So, you know, uh, we have bragging rights on that for a a while. Uh, There'll be another poll next week. Okay. We're all pretty excited around here with the daily updates and announcements coming out of Games Workshop and the promise of a new edition of the game that combines everything we love about 8th and corrects maybe a few of its issues. There's been so much uh, there's been so much news we thought it was a good time to cover off what we know and what the new game might look like when you add it all together. So our own John Damaris sat down with two other titans of 40K content creation. Between them, these three have been watching everything and applying it to their extensive knowledge and experience of the game. So uh, for a very special episode of 40K today, we're dedicating the whole show to hashtag new 40K. Here's John with Paul Murphy of Forge the Narrative and Mikey Herbert from Hellstorm Wargaming. So let's, let's just go around the table. What are you most excited about? We'll start with Mikey. Um, I think... The thing I'm most excited about is the one that everyone is talking about. It's the fact that they're going to make terrain less binary, whether it does something or does nothing, but mostly it does nothing. Um, from what it sounds like, they're going to have like special rules for each type of terrain or each type of board setup you've got. And having something that's more interesting in just plus one cover or does nothing is uh, sounds really, really exciting to me. Uh, everyone seems to be talking about it, but I also think it's the most impactful change uh, to the game by the sounds of it. So I think that's why everyone seems to have the same thing as terrain is the best one. Yeah, and GW has given us some like just just some hints at that, right? So they've told us that there's this new obstructing keyword that basically if you draw a line across that piece of terrain and it's obstructing, it doesn't matter what you can see, you're blocked, right? Because uh, – yeah. Right, um, which makes it a lot cleaner. I think anything that steps us away from true line of sight is going to make the game experience better. If there's just some more concrete ways we can determine what's going on, as opposed to getting down there with a laser and <laughs> being like, "No, no, <laughs> I can see your tail clearly. Come here and look. You can. Can you see? Like, if I look across the barrel of my gun, I can see the tail of your through the cracks your in that terrain yeah. that is that have only appeared yeah. because you've been storing it sideways for. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think that's hopefully with with the fact that you're going to be applying keywords to terrain. Hopefully, rather than because GW have rules for terrain already, but it's just for a specific kit that they sell built in a specific way. And realistically, people's terrain sets is what they have in a box that they store under the table or in the garage or something. So, if they can make table more abstract but works better in in the game, that's only a good thing for everybody. Mikey stole my answer, so I'm going to go with uh, the fallback penalty. You know, we saw today on the article that the, you, you can burn a CP and cut down your enemy when they're follow, when they're running away from you. That's one of the more, I guess, um, awkward things in the game right now. If you try to play assault, is the is the uh, the potential for people to just ev- you know evaporate out of combat. Now, the mm. penalty is not extreme, but it's something. And it's uh, as someone who likes to play assault-based armies, the combination of terrain pot- potentially being uh, more of a, an actual factor in the game, and then uh, 
after I've done damage to my opponent, then potentially taking more damage as they leave sounds really awesome. It also gives them something to think about, right? Because now suddenly they're like, uh, we'll just use a hypothetical. I've got my Harlequin troopers who are very expensive on a point per model basis. Mm. If I take three or four mortal wounds on my 10 man unit, like uh, that's not something I necessarily want to do just to fall back so I can shoot your 30 orc boys. <laughs> well, I, I think that, that falling back will always be worth it, right? You're falling back to either get closer to an objective or uh, allow the enemy to be shot at or something like that. But now there is a bit of a risk. Like if you, if you would potentially give up a, a kill point or whatever, when you weren't expecting to, that could really slip the balance of the game. I think the I think that's a good point. But I think the thing that I am most excited about is the changes to command points. So they've, mm. they've sort of previewed today uh, and, and in the past that everybody's going to get a set amount of command points based on uh, arm, our army sizes. So if you're at 2,000 points, I think you're going to start with 12. They've also said that uh, at the beginning of every turn, there's now a command phase where you play those beginning of turn effects or, or effects that uh, 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 happen for the whole turn, and you generate a command point, I believe. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and then the thing that I think is great about that is so many armies are penalized so heavily for being elite in nature. And I, Custodes is like the golden poster boy for this, right? You can't yeah. make three battalion custodies lists, it's literally point impossible. <laughs> so, uh, you never had a lot of command points to use your really cool strats uh, with custodies, but now you get as many command points as anybody else, and it sort of levels the playing field between the elite armies and the hor horde armies, and now maybe we'll see a little less of this like abstracted weird thing where you had like the rusty 17 or the loyal 32 where you just had this like random detachment do nothing detachment that was literally just there for command points and it just detracted from the flavor of the army the immersion of the experience um, now you'll see like these really cool pure custodies armies or grain art armies and they'll be going toe-to-toe -to -toe with a huge guard horde and it, and it, it'll all make sense like there's no reason to reach outside your codex to just add something random for a few CPs. I don't it's know. That's a difficult thing to balance. It, it's a, or I should say it's proven to be a difficult thing to balance. And, and I think that everyone getting the same will present its own challenges, but it'll be different. In my opinion, fewer challenges than to try to balance someone's access to multiple battalions. Yeah. I think you're going to see the, at the minute in a competitive army, you'll see really strange units being taken just so they can squeeze another CP out or another five CP if they're using, like, as we've mentioned, double battalion. But now I think we're going to see something opposite where people are taking units just to fill in slots in the original battalion just so they don't have to take another detachment because they don't want to sacrifice any CP. So you're going to see, like, just one battalion, but I imagine, or one brigade and then hardly anything else. If you do, it'll be quite rare. That's John Damaris with Paul Murphy and Mikey Herbert. Stay with us. The conversation continues in 30 seconds. Today's episode of 40K Today is brought to you by Frontline Gaming. Frontline Gaming is a one-stop shop for all your Warhammer hobby needs, discounted products, American-made gaming mats and terrain, and a full line of miniatures painting service and daily hobby content. And this can all be found at FrontlineGaming.org. Welcome back. So today's show, as you've heard, is all about the new 40K and what the game might look like when you take what we already know from the GW releases and apply it to the game with three guys who have played 40K uh, plenty and watched and talked about it even more over the years. So let's get back to John with Paul Murphy and Mikey Herbert. You know, there's a lot of just Imperial lists that are like Castellan and, and Blood Angels and, and Guard, right? So because... Those were the best things from those three codexes, and when you put them all together, it was just it was just tough to beat. Well, now you've got a you've got a significant cost. You you have to in order to do that, you lose a lot of CP, which in a lot of ways lose a lot of flexibility and power. I don't know. What do you guys think? Uh, yeah, I I totally agree. I said you, you're probably not going to see so much soup anymore unless it's for a really clutchly unit. Like say you're running Drakari and you want some really like high firepower flyers and you don't want to use Void Ravens, then you might see that. But I don't think you're going to see it as often as you would anymore. It's it's a crazy big change in the t in the way of uh, building your army. Yeah, it's further incentivizing us to to stay one particular codex and but they also the rules have supported that like it was like if you were a blood angel player before then if you wanted to play them 
and have any prayer of success, you had to break out. And that's different now because of the rules. And now we're – so we've got better rules for a lot of the, the standalone armies uh, via mm-hmm. Psychic Awakening and you know other things, chapter approved and whatever. And now we have a system that seems to kind of reward it a little bit more. And so I think we, we will see a lot more monofaction armies and, and people will be happy to play them. I yeah, agree. and I should say like Space Marines have kind of like been the the frontier of that because they get a benefit for being pure Space Marines. Now they have a benefit of uh, having more command points over Super Armies as well, as well as the doctrines they already have. Absolutely, and we we have seen like from a design standpoint, um, the psych a lot of the Psychic Awakenings, you know, like Tides with Grey Knights, doctrines with Marines, they yeah. sort of encourage you away from soup without taking it away from you, which is kind of nice. Mm. This uh, command point addition every round to get a, basically get a command point, that's something that I believe has been seen in Sigmar. It's definitely been seen yeah, in Kill does. Team. Uh, so that's a mechanic they've been experimenting with for quite some time. And and as someone who plays both of those games, I do enjoy it. It's um, it's sometimes you have to remind yourself to do it. Oh, I didn't add my command point or whatever. It's, it's You just have, you have to get used to it. Uh, but I like it. It it adds what what I've found that it makes for more exciting uh, later turns of the game. Yeah, because 40k has this habit of develop de- devolving into you've got a, like a few remnants of an army, and I've got a few remnants of an army, and no CPs, and it's just sort of playing out the motions where uh, some CP could add some excitement and interest to those turns five and six. You know, I think I think you you hit the nail right on the head there, Paul. Yeah, it just creates more possibilities later on, doesn't it? So yeah, I'm a big believer. You know, spin them if you got them. I mean, like we play an aggressive game. You don't know if you're going to make it to round three with your models, right? <laughs> uh, so yeah. spin them early and often, and so can you, now you can do that, uh, and then you you aren't you're not going to feel just like you've run out of gas and you're just getting you're punch drunk or whatever in rounds four or five. Yeah, has anybody heard what the cost is going to be to to go out of or to soup or? Uh, to use a derogatory term, I guess. Uh, have we heard that from GW yet, or is that still sort of under the covers? Nothing, Nothing more than I've what seen. we've seen in the community site, yep. Yeah, that's what I thought. So a minimum right, okay. three command points for a second battalion, I guess. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, I, I do have something I want to talk to you guys about that I think is probably one of the most impactful changes to the game. Mm-hmm. And it's not even a competitive role. It's the crusade system. Because I think that... That is going to be such an incredible recruitment tool to get people playing the game. Because you can imagine having like crusade leagues at your local game night. And the veterans will all be excited because they're always looking for an excuse to buy new armies or try something new, right? And new players have this nice entry point that's sort of story driven. Like they get to, it's kind of like investing in your own role playing character, right? It's your army, you know, your general and, and, and your different characters. And, and you, like a unit might become a veteran unit and it just might have stories to tell about it. And it'll make a really fun narrative experience for people that has some rules around it. I don't know, what do you guys think of the crusade system? Yeah, I dig it. I think people sometimes they want to feel that connection. Something is, uh, has a higher gravity, you know, than maybe just a one-off game. And not everybody wants that. Not everybody needs that. Uh, but this gives it to them. It's just another way to play. Yeah, I think it's quite interesting that they've kind of alluded to that if I'm playing a crusade, I don't have to play with the same people every week or the same group of people every week. I can can play anyone and add that to my system, to my essentially my build my own adventure against anyone I like and come back at the end, which sounds really fun because I play a lot of fun games and when I'm filming and stuff like that. So if I can kind of link those together quite loosely, but also have, as you say, a story to tell for these particular models I'm using, that sounds really good. And then they can go off to a tournament get their ass handed to him and then come back whimpering and uh, try again later. I'm curious to see like, okay, what sort of narrative events could you run like across a year, for example, at different conventions or like what, what kinds of things are going to come from this? That's going to add a whole new experience to the game for people, a way for people to engage in the game and to, to come hang out with us at these competitive events. Cause competitive play obviously drives a lot of attendance, at a lot of these events. Right. But also give like this really cool outlet for, you know, your buddies that maybe aren't as competitive as you, but to have just as much fun and investment in going to like an LVO or whatever. Um, I think that'll be really, really neat to see how that all shakes out. I do. I see the value in that, but I mean, this is something that that 
people that I know that would never even consider traveling want to do. And that's, I think this is designed exactly for them. Uh, and, and maybe it inspires them to do things, especially when they get to take their, their commander who graduated from the ranks of scout and has now been turned into dreadnought and they get to see how he performs on the world stage, you know? Yep, absolutely. But this is, this is, this could replace your, um, you know, monthly D and D session. Yeah, I yeah, totally I agree. I totally agree. I think the the scope of like a one day event or like a two day weekend event where you start out playing your first game of five hundred points uh, combat patrol, and then the final game being a two thousand point with the hardened veterans at the front and your new recruits at the back. I think that's going to be really really cool. And again, like I think I described it that way myself. It's kind of like D and D light type these guys are they have character they've had adventures they've got stories to tell and here they are to prove it with extra bonuses on the battlefield which is something we've not seen before yeah it looks fun for sure Mm. i i also relish the idea of people modeling for the stories that they tell right (laughs) yeah (laughs) absolutely yeah it's gonna it's gonna be cool so i'm really hyped for that okay one more time quickly around the table what else are you excited for in ninth I'll let Paul go first. I don't want to steal his answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm looking forward to trying to fill like a complete tank army. You know, this because where it was basically impossible before, there were just too many gotchas. But, um, you know, I guess I'm, I'm close combat first. That's what I want to play. And that, that seems really exciting. But the, if I had to rank it next, I'm, I'm looking forward to having a, a, a mechanized army on the table again. I think that what I'm most excited about is kind of like, we know the game. A lot of people who are in the game know it quite well. Like the, for, for example, like the fight phase and the consolidation and all the tricks that you can do. But hopefully, they just clarify that in the rule book. And if that's clearer for everybody, or they make it so it's like, so if it, like try pointing is an is an example in the rule book, or even if they re- remove that completely, so it's no, there is no gotchas. If you said that'd be really really cool. But just clarification over the rule book rather than having to download an FAQ is what I'm most excited about. I guess last thing I'll say right before we close out is uh, them finally coming into the digital age with an app that will hopefully have all of the facts, all of the rules at everybody's fingertips. So it's never this like I've got to take 14, 14 books with me to a tournament. I'm very excited about that. That's our own John Damaris speaking to Paul Murphy of Forge the Narrative and Mikey from Hellstorm Wargaming. Both of those guys, by the way, Paul and Mikey, have some great content on the new 40K on their own channels. Make sure you check them out. There's so much information there and so much great analysis. The links are in our show notes. All right, before we say goodbye, it's time for the model of the day. It's the, the model of the day, the, the model of the day, the, the model of the day. Oh, man, you have to see what Nicholas has done with his Death Guard. Super bright. I know, weird for Death Guard, but it looks so good. Really bright. Non-metal metallic greens, amazing highlights to make the whole thing pop. The bronze color on the weapons is bang on. Everything about this is superb. And even with all that detail, really, really clean, uh, beautifully done. Nicholas even teaches us how to do it on his Patreon. You can check the pictures on our Instagram and on our Facebook Uh, Links in our show notes for this episode as well. And as always, if you have a model or you've seen a model that you think we should feature on the model of the day, you know, who wouldn't want that song sung about them? Uh, Let us know. You can get in touch with us any way you want. Via Facebook might be the easiest. And that's it for today. Thank you so much for joining us. A big thank you to our content producer, Alex Painter, our social media whiz, Tanya Gates, and our technical producer, Seamus Ronan, for all their hard work again in putting this program together every day of the week along with our newest team member, Paul Murphy, for stepping up with hosting and interviews. Uh, Also, tomorrow, don't forget to tune in to hear our best of the week. You can download it via the Frontline Gaming Network or your own favourite podcast player. So we'll see you tomorrow. Until then, for the 40K Today team, I'm Steve John, and that's what's happening in 40K Today.